Hey, it's Dr. Marissa Lee Naismith here, and I'm so honored to be sharing today's interview round episode with you. Listen, and you will be inspired by amazing healthcare practitioners, voice teachers, and music industry professionals who will share their stories, knowledge, and experiences within their specialized fields to help you live your best life every day. As singers, our whole body is our instrument, and our instrument echoes how we feel physically, mentally, and emotionally. So don't wait any longer. Take charge and optimize your instrument now. Remember that to sing is more than just learning about how to use the voice. It's about a voice and beyond. So without further ado, let's go to today's episode. Heidi Moss Erickson is an acclaimed performer, voice educator, and scientist who prefers to describe herself as a seeker. In this episode, we get a rare snapshot into Heidi's personal and professional life as she opens up about what she defines as her serendipitous life. Heidi holds a double biology degree and a master's degree in biochemistry from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a music degree from Oberlin. And Heidi tells us how she was able to merge her passion for music with her love of science. In 2007, she suffered a rare facial paralysis and was told by doctors and singing teachers that she would never be able to sing again. Heidi shares with us the tremendous impact of this devastating injury, but also, too, how it inspired her deeper exploration into the science of singing. And it was through her own investigation, perseverance, resilience, and adhering to a daily self care regime that she was able to rehabilitate herself and prove everyone wrong. This life-changing occurrence has allowed Heidi to let down her barriers, become more vulnerable, accepting of herself, and to continue on her journey of self-discovery. In this episode, Heidi also discusses the similarities between music and science, the importance of neuroscience and voice training, how we must learn to accept mistakes when they occur in singing, in the same way as we do in a science experiment. The importance of playfulness in the singing lesson, the difference between the mind and the brain, the positive outcomes when adhering to a self-care regime. And there is much, much more that you will learn from Heidi in this episode. You are going to love Heidi Moss Erickson. So, without further ado, Let's go to today's episode. Good morning in Australia and good evening in San Francisco to Heidi Moss. Do you call yourself Heidi Moss Erickson? Is that now what? I do because I am, well, not quite a newlywed, but newlywed-ish. So I've added the Erickson to my last name now. Okay. Well, that's okay. I added my last name finally after we've been together for years and I only just added it recently. <laughs> it's when we start to like them, maybe. <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, the more, the more I'm with them, the more I say, okay, I'll take it now. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. How is life for you in San Francisco at the moment? I love it here. I feel I am an East Coast, New Jersey, New Yorker girl in the US and they're very different worlds, but I mm -hmm. now that I'm transplanted, I love the weather and the, and the people and the food and the being able to go out in nature, so it's really a beautiful beautiful place to live. I believe you're near Napa though. I, yeah, that's my little secret. I work in San Francisco, but I live near some vineyards, which is, is really nice to, to go see, especially right now because it's yes. the, the crush season here. So 
you see lots of ripe grapes. So I'm, I'm very blessed. Okay. Well, it's one thing to look at them and it's another thing to consume them, Heidi. <laughs> I know. Well, you know. We see a little of that too out here. <laughs> That's all right. We, yes, I love visiting wineries. I must admit I have a little bit of a joy in that as well. Well, now, I think mu music and wine go well together, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sensory, especially in the brain. It's your brain sensing all these kinds of granular experiences that you correlate with pleasure. So why not? Okay, I'll blame it on that side of my yeah. personality. <laughs> you have to have that excuse. It's scientific. Just tell people that. Okay, I was told by a scientist. Yes. Now, Heidi, you are a performer, an educator, and a scientist, but you prefer prefer to call yourself a seeker. Now yeah. that's a lot of different hats. We need to do a background search here. What okay. came first? So I think there's the nature and nurture question. And so I think I was always naturally probably more of the musician singer, but the nurture, I grew up and I'm the youngest of six and everyone is a scientist or a doctor. Oh. So I the nurture part i felt like that was the default i felt like well i should be this i this is what everyone else does isn't this what people do is they become a scientist and i had you know very curious older siblings that taught me about antibodies when i was you know in grammar school and things like that <laughs> so i think my natural state was was this musician but I always argue that science and music are the same because it's this technical foundation that everyone needs who's a musician or a scientist, but what creates, it's that creativity, right, that takes everyone to the next level. So I think they're both the same, at least I feel for myself. I don't feel like a different person by having been in both because I do the same thing. I'm creative and I think about technical fun things too. So when it came to formal studies, I'm assuming that you must have been listening to music as a child. You obviously had that love of music as a child. Did you study music before you studied sciences? Yes, I started in piano. I heard my brother take piano lessons and so I was about five years old. So I started actually as a pianist and was obsessed with that. And then in high school, there was a old, woman who would who taught voice and she would play opera recordings at her house and i started hearing that and it was just i'd never heard anything like that sound mm -hmm. and so that turned me on to opera singing because it was much more fun to stand in front of the piano and sing than sit behind the piano and play yes. you know? yes. if you're a little ham kind of performer i was like i want to do that so that's what i i switched over to more singing directed things and said goodbye to the piano for a little while. <laughs> so then you went and you obtained a music degree at Oberlin? Correct, so, yes. So from there, did you transition across to a performance career? Ah, so at Oberlin, i had this great double degree program, so I could still wear both hats at that school. Um, and Richard Miller, classical singers will know him from his book, The Structure of Singing. And so he had a voice lab there. So it was a good way to combine music and science. But after mm -hmm. Oberlin, I was not a performer. I went on to study biochemistry and then went into a research lab where I worked as a professional scientist to fund my singing habit. So um, I lived in New York City and I was able to do research by day and sing at night. Kind of thing. And, and you studied a lot. You graduated with a double degree yes. in biology, a yes. master's in biochemistry. Yes. And then this is the, the fun <laughs> one, I feel, and I have to read this. You studied telomer telomeres. Yeah, at, telomer. Yeah, at Rockefeller University. Now, what on earth is that? <laughs> and why does one study that and like was it something that you thought oh this sounds cool yeah. I'm, I, you get up one morning and you go i'm gonna go and study telomeres like what is that i love that i love that yes um yeah it's like it's not like the telomere epiphany i've always been a microbiology fan like i like the small things so i loved 
genetics and DNA and cell biology and, you know, biochemistry. And so when I went to look for a job um, at Rockefeller, there was this female leaders in science were sort of rare. And there was this female scientist, Tizia Delanga, actually the... Um, Telomeres won the Nobel Prize in 2009, two women. It's a very female dominated field, which is sort of really? interesting. Yeah. And what telomeres are, are the ends of DNA mm -hmm. in your chromosomes, but they're implicated in both cancer and aging. Because I always say aging is, you know, if people say, I want to live forever. Well, I say, well, that's a tumor. You know, <laughs> it's like, that's what a cancer cell is, right? You know, longevity. So your cells have a lifespan. And what controls that lifespan are these ends of your DNA that sort of shorten over time. And that shortening will tell the cell it's time to, to go. And that's yeah. how you sort of lifespan works. So yeah, so I got in, that was sort of uh, I found that subject fascinating because of those kinds of two critical points of science. People are interested in aging and people are interested in cancer. And so this sort of merges these two very powerful human things, but at the micro level. Wow. So yes. when you started to combine voice and science, was yeah. that at a time, had you started teaching by that time? Yeah, I taught on and off sort of that whole time. I wasn't a full-time teacher until after I left the lab. So that was probably about, see, I'm old now. That was probably like 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I know. I'm not old. Everyone on my show is 21. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're all, all right. 21. I, I love that. Someone, yeah. I, it was just my birthday and someone said, happy 29th birthday. I was like, okay, I like 21 better. It's a little. Oh, you know, so much better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I was always thinking pedagogically as a teacher, just because Richard Miller taught me about voice science and the mechanism. So I was always obsessed with the mechanism. Um, but I hadn't thought about sort of the brain part until later. And I'm, I'm, I think I didn't become a singer professionally in a, in a lot of ways because the psychological part was so hard, I think, to be a professional musician and be under scrutiny all the time by either really? coaches teachers and yeah so that that gave me a little bit of fear of it that that mm. the lab didn't do and i think if you're a sensitive person it's it's a brutal brutal thing and it's sad that i think a lot of musicians sometimes struggle with the the lens that's under you all the time so mm. so you had performance anxiety Yes. Audition anxiety, I would say. Performing was much easier, but I think the audition part was where I would fall apart. Yeah. But that's really interesting because I, when I was doing my background search on you, yes, I, I saw that you entered so many competitions. Most of them I couldn't even pronounce the <laughs> names of. <laughs> so I just, went, I just thought, I'm not going to ask you that question. I can't pronounce these names. <laughs> But you did, you entered so many and you did so well. You yes. can't be under more greater scrutiny than what you are when you're in a competition. Yes, I think that's sort of the nature of at least the classical singing world. You know, they have mm. the Met competition and I would always get to the semifinals. And I think imposter syndrome or, or, or nervousness at the finals, I would always tank at the finals. That was sort of my tradition. <laughs> I said, that's Heidi's Heidi's way. She will get to the semifinals and then she will fall on her face in the finals. But I think that experience taught me a lot and it makes me a better teacher because I now mm -hmm. tell my students who are in competitions, you know, it's the same thing as a performance. And now I understand what performance anxiety is from, you know, the neuroscience perspective. I wish I knew then what I know now. So I can now advise students on how to best set their mind and body up for these things that are a lot of pressure because, you know, at the time I had no idea what was happening to me, yes. but now, now I yes. do. That's such a shame because I see that you were, you were given the title of being or the descriptor of being a rich and radiant soprano. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know about you. <laughs> Dude, that's a little scary. Yeah, no, that was, yeah, I feel very lucky that when I could 
when I felt free, and this is why, again, I, I'm so passionate about how the brain gets into the zone or how the brain can find that because when you're there, then it's, it is wonderful and mm. it's wonderful on both sides, right? It's wonderful for the performer and it's wonderful for the audience. And so I think if we can find that kind of magic nugget and be able to know what it is and know how to get there and what is an authentic performance in, you know, the unconscious competence or however we like to call it, yes. you know, I do think that's the Holy grail because that's what all artists want Absolutely. is that. So I think it's a really important endeavor to find that, you know. Mm. So when you embarked on this journey of where voice science met science, was this, did you embark on that journey because you could see there was a need for this and, or was it a natural curiosity? Yeah, I love that question. I feel serendipity is a very lovely mistress sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I agree. I think, I think what happened was I was in the lab and then, you know, got, I was still studying. I would take the Crosstown bus to Juilliard and, and I did start entering competitions while still actively being in science. And that was sort of the transition. As far as getting into the science of singing, I was always interested in the mechanism. Yes. The psychology part and the neuroscience part didn't come until I suffered my seventh cranial nerve injury that then forced me to reevaluate my own life, art, personally, professionally, because at that time I had given up science for a full time singing and teaching career. So I was actually had contracts and was performing professionally at that stage when I got this injury. So that I think was the big turning point that shifted everything for me. Yes. Well, we may talk about that injury now, seeing as you've brought it up and yeah. we'll come back to some of these other questions yeah. as, that I'm very keen to know the answers to. So this injury occurred in 2007. Correct. Yes. So what was the circumstances around that? Yeah, so I was pregnant with my second daughter and I was sort of in a very challenging personal situation. And I think I'd always I think this is part of the artist's journey too. You know, I'm open mm -hmm. about mental health. I'm open about being in, you know, unhealthy relationships or situations. And so yes. it was a very stressful time in uh -huh. my life. I had a toddler, I was pregnant, and um so when Bell's palsy hits, I actually just wrote an article for the Washington Post. So that came out last Friday, yeah. uh, reviewed a book on that. Um, but Bell's palsy, they don't really know why it happens sometimes. So it can be stress. It can be a virus. Um, yes. Anything that can inflame that nerve. And so th when that nerve gets inflamed, um, it's it destroys all of the nerves that enervate your facial expression as well as some in the larynx and some in your neck and some in your ear so there's most people will recover because it's not as bad you know mm -hmm. it's not, not permanent but in my case yes. I, the worst of the worst basically damage you could get but they didn't know that until several months in and that was the the i think of that yeah yes because from what I understand, it is usually temporary and it is usually like the, the maximum is around six months. So you must have just waited and expected that it would go and it didn't. But did you just wake with it and you could see something was wrong and it gradually worsened over the next couple of days? Yeah. So what happened was it was I had woken up, it did happen overnight, and I went to brush my teeth, you know, I was sort of groggy, and I went to brush my teeth, and I couldn't spit. And I was like trying to spit, <laughs> I couldn't spit the toothpaste. And it didn't hit me until I was like, what's going on? And then I couldn't speak. Oh. And I thought I had a stroke, because then I looked in the mirror, yeah. and my whole face was droopy. And I had no ability to move that side of my face. So I went to the ER thinking I had a stroke, and I'm pregnant. And, and, uh, the nurse was like, oh, you're fine. You just have Bell's palsy, gave me some, 
you know, antivirals just in case and some steroids and sent me home. It, so it was actually not a lot of care in the acute moment. It was just because, oh, you'll recover. Because that's what they assume for everybody. Yes. You'll recover, you yes. know, so I was like, okay, I'm going to look funny for a couple of months and then, you know, I'll deal with that. But then, of course, nothing happened. And then they do the MRI and they do the EMG and then you get the neurologist's you know, white face and sad look saying, I'm so sorry. And uh, that was that was sort of devastating that moment. Yeah. Mm. So how life changing has this been for you personally, like in your day to day life as a woman and as a mother? So I mean, I love that you touch on both woman and the mother, because I think those were in, the, in my mind at the time, you know, the singer was tertiary, even though I had had the, this great, I was actually doing so well, I had some great contracts, I loved performing. But there's something about losing your face that you can't describe. I mean, people, you know, I used to be a soubrette, I used to be flirty, I used to be, you know, so I had that side, right? The the eternal flirt, you know, outgoing. I can see that in you. <laughs> yeah. I can see, yeah, I can see you'd be rather cheeky. Yes, I was totally cheeky. Yeah. And, you know, talking to strangers and just, you know, just fun. And, and so I think taking away something that was so much a part of my being, right? It's an identity thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you mentioned the mother, you know, I had two very young children and, and you read, you know, I was still a scientist, so I would read child rearing on how important the mother's face was to a child's yeah. understanding yeah. of the world and emotion. So I think... I was just addressing those two main things, but singing also, I couldn't pronounce things. I had lost about a third or a fourth of my top range because of one of the muscles. So, mm -hmm. and I was a high soprano. So, and then vanity in this business, right? They're not going to hire someone with a broken face for one of those roles that I was traditionally cast for. So it was, it hit so many av parts of my identity at once, I think. Yes. The traumatic part. Yeah. So how did you cope then, like, from a physical and a mental and an emotional perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it took me until even now for me to finally wrap my head around everything. These things are very long journeys and lifetime yes. journeys, I think. But at the time, I tried to, I, I love humor as a way to sort of heal. And so I actually threw uh, what I called a pity party as a, you know, it was like a joke, like a literal party. I invited people over, but I called it like a pity party. Oh my and, gosh. And I had everyone paint masks. And so it was sort of like a fun way because I knew people who were close to me or even acquaintances, they didn't know how to talk about it, right? Yes. It's, you say, I'm so sorry, or, and yes. I didn't want people to feel that way. I wanted people yes. to sort of it's okay we can talk about it and make light of it and and so that was sort of the way I coped externally mm -hmm. which I thought was important internally um and that goes back to sort of what you know we do have two worlds sometimes our internal world and our external world internally I felt really lost just because I had given up science for singing and and now I felt like I couldn't go back to either. And so that gave me another identity crisis in a way. Mm. And then that led me down to sort of combining them inadvertently. <laughs> yes. Are you a spiritual person? I say I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I was raised Catholic. Yay. But I, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Same. Which caused a lot of problems, you know, but, but I think, you know, I've had these moments in life that have just been too purposeful, too sort of coincidental and serendipitous that I just, you know, I, I feel that my curses became blessings. And I didn't even tell you how I got back into singing. It was just had to do with a landlord. I was, I'd given up singing and I had rented an apartment and I heard music downstairs so this was my landlord randomly after three months in graduate school giving up music and i heard music downstairs and it was live and i asked my landlord i said i did i hear live music he said yes he said i'm a musician turns out he's not just a musician it was the most i don't know if you know purcell is a classical composer from the yes. baroque period and he's the foremost scholar of purcell 
and all of Purcell's numbers are ranked by Z numbers, just like Mozart with K numbers. And it's because that was my land, my landlord's last name, Zimmerman. And so he had an organization and I said, can I audition for you? But I, I believe if I, if he was not my landlord, I would not have sung again. So it was one of those like weird spiritual plantings, you know? So was this after the, the Bell's palsy? No, or this was a prior. Yeah, this, I, I, yeah, I went backwards just to oh, talk, okay. just to talk about the spirituality of just yes. like these, I feel like life presents you with these random events and, mm -hmm. and sometimes they feel a little too coincidental in a way. I agree because my next question was going to be everything happens for a reason. So right. hence, yeah. Have you discovered the reason why this has happened to you? Oh, wow. look, I love you. This is so such a great question. I feel it has taught me more about everything. I feel like I have a purpose now in a way. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it it's very. Yeah, oh, gosh, I'm I, I don't even know how to articulate it. I think it, it opened the door to so many things about our art and myself that now have given me a path that is really unique, I think. And I'm lucky that I can indulge in it and communicate what I've learned through having not only to retrain the physical, but it touched on retraining the psychological, which made me realize the things that were I was struggling with as a singer before Bell's palsy. So you know, um, when you study singing in the brain, you realize, oh, this is how the brain vocalizes. And we're mm -hmm. sort of doing it wrong sometimes when we focus on micromanaging everything and micromanaging the mechanism. So it, it transformed how I teach a thousand percent and it transformed how I understand the instrument. And um, so those two things, yeah. Yes. And from what I see when I follow you, because I do <laughs> follow you on social media, you are a great inspiration to all of us. Mm -hmm. and, and But what I love is the vulnerability. Thank and you. you put yourself out there. And I think so many more of us could do the same. Yeah. I, yeah, I think when you're a performer, or, and I do think that's what palsy ta taught me is that, you know, now it's on my face. I can't hide anything. Mm -hmm. You see, I can't make myself look perfect. I can't project that I have it all together. And so I think there was something um, liberating about that in a way. Wow. Because then it's, and then I found the more I did that, the more people would then say thank you and then mm -hmm. they could open up in a way that was cathartic mm -hmm. for them and i think mm -hmm. it's that's part of it it's it, i think you know in science we are allowed to have failed experiments and you learn from that it as an as a performer in the public eye any misstep is is criticized and so it's it's a really hard way to live yes I, you're in if you're not feel like you can't make a mistake so when i teach there's a lot of play there's a lot of we're just gonna sing this for fun and be a crazy character and you know i call it like the scientist in a crib you know it's like the baby who takes the toy and bites its head off and then it tastes bad or throws it across the room you know i think we need to play more and find this kind of deeper reason why without judgment so give ourselves permission to make mistakes and to just play sometimes. Sounds like to me, you appreciate yourself more than yeah. what you did. And so have, has your perspective on life in terms of appreciation and gratitude changed also? Absolutely. And as soon as I made that shift, then I was able to meet like the love of my life. You know, I like then love and opportunity comes to you. It's this yes. very, strange phenomenon is when you sort of accept it in yourself um and then become content in yourself and i try to teach this i have two daughters you know then things come to you 
And it's it's a, a way of being that I feel is so much healthier, that I'm not trying to fit in a, someone else's box. I've created my own life and happiness and, and from inside and then the rest follows, if that yes. makes sense. And yeah. from a physical perspective, mm-hmm. did you learn to take better care of yourself? Like in terms of self-care, did that regime change? And did you appreciate sleep and <laughs> diet and exercise? Like did they, were they part of the healing journey as well? A million percent. Um, I'm not a guru. I'm not mm-hmm. super, I'm not. But I think, you know, with an inflammatory disease, which is what Bell's palsy is, and I had other inflammatory diseases like Hashimoto's as well, and I had depression growing up, you know, so I had all of these, you know, whole body holistic things that what's the cause, right? We sort of doctors shrug their shoulders and they give, you know, and I come from a medical family, so I was sort of analyzing it from from a very micro way. And I, as I said in the beginning, I love the micro stuff. But as soon as I started thinking about the macro, which I'm lucky living in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, because they're known for that, you know, a sort mm-hmm. of healthy eating and, and yoga and meditation, but there's now science behind it. And I'm actually, you know, going to be even teaching this for singers, you know, it's like the biohacking. So I do things, I call it caveman biology. <laughs> sometimes. Oh, really? Because it's sort of, you know, I wake up in the morning, we need to expose our eyes to natural sunlight, you know, just little things like this that we forget in the modern world can make you healthier. And sleep is definitely one of those things. It It's necessary for learning. And how many nights did I stay up studying for organic chemistry and not sleeping at all? And of course, I'm, or a night, remember I told you I didn't do well in the finals. Well, I would stay up all night just trying, and that was the worst thing I could do. Yes. So, value of sleep and self-care have changed changed my life for sure even mindful rest during practice is important now we know there was i'm doing a journal club on that there was a paper that came out that said even 10 to 20 seconds of just mindful rest in between a motor task can solidify that task 20 to 30 fold so now with students they'll do something and then it's like you know we'll just have a little zen moment and for all of us, it's it's just those little things that now seemed anecdotal in the quote self care mm. are now sci- have met the scientific proof, and that is something that's very exciting to me because yeah, yes, I love all that, and and for me in the mornings, I I'm very big on like journaling or just having mm. like a it's only just a five minute. I'm not great at writing essays. But right. that's one thing I set the intention every morning yep. is to take a moment and take a breath. Exactly. And I think we can all do with that, can't we? We can all just take that moment just to be present with ourselves, to breathe. Yes. Absolutely. And I, and journaling is so important. It's like the art. I had the artist's way many, many years ago. That's sort of where I got my idea for the monster you know that i have this stuffed animal for my students but you have she to t- show us oh yeah we, we do have youtube some oh YouTube. so this is my monster and i actually for my vocal i teach anatomy and physiology of the voice at the san francisco conservatory and at the beginning of the semester i give everybody a tiny stuffed monster and i have students come back to me years later that say they still have their monster and the monster is the only one that's allowed to negatively judge oh. so if you have a negative thought while you're singing and you know you want to you know cuz sometimes i'll teach a lesson and someone will do something and before i even say anything they'll go oh that was terrible and you're just oh. saying mm-hmm. where did that come from i know right and, and so it just shows you that is learned, right? That yes. action is learned. And so I, so now that they, I say that's for the monster to think. That's not for you to think. And I have one of my students uh, is a psychiatrist at UCSF. So this is like a professional, and he he'll he'll catch himself when he say, "You're going to bring out the monster, aren't you?" You know. So it's even my adults who are highly educated it's not it's honestly something we all need to be mindful of of that you were talking about being in the moment with ourselves as soon as you start judging you're out of the moment 
And I think that's what's useful about the monster, not just for singing and voice lessons, but but in life too, you know. Yes. And yeah. I think as I always say, as singers, we're pretty messed up anyway, aren't we? We're also we're always judging ourselves. And you're so right. Yeah. My students, I call it that self-feedback. Yes. And yeah. in the middle of songs and at the ends of phrases, I just go, that is banned. But yeah. I'm, gonna tr- I'm gonna try that monster. I'm gonna yeah. get them a monster and I'll let I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> He reposted, yeah. I, I had I had this great coach. Oh, I didn't drop the F bomb yet, so maybe it's time. Oh, yeah. To- I, I yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have was- a swear jar for people that are <laughs> yeah, listening and and not watching on YouTube. I'm holding up a swear <laughs> jar because I've heard Heidi being interviewed on other podcasts <laughs> and she swears a lot. So I made a swear <laughs> jar. That was very kind. I just realized I've been such a good girl this time. Yeah. I haven't dropped the f bomb, but I had this great coach, and he would have these master classes, and I would, you know, sing, and I would say like, you know, I would curse. So oh, okay, you know, swear job. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, or I would make a face, you know, in the middle of the aria, and so he decided, and just for me, it wasn't for anyone else. He said, as soon as I see judgment on your face, or as soon as you curse, everyone in the room has to clap. Like just one clap and it's so jolting because you realize how often you're, you're Mm -hmm. shadowing your own self criticism. And so as soon as they saw me like listening or criticizing, they would all. And so the whole room was just constantly. So that was a wake up call to myself too, that I am, I am showing my own displeasure of my singing on my face, which is just not a good thing if you're a performer so no so the no. monster has many has uh has a really full belly from my <laughs> my self-judgment but now that was one thing that palsy took away too is because i said everyone's looking at my face so no one cares about my voice so i had much less self-consciousness after bell's palsy which is interesting that yeah. is interesting i read that you rehabbed yourself I did. Yes, you were told by teachers and and mm-hmm. doctors that you would never sing again. Yes. But you use some of well, I'm sure a lot of your science background to rehab yourself. What was the biggest obstacle you had to overcome and how did you rehab yourself? Yeah. I mean, I you know, obviously sometimes when you're told you can't do something, it makes you want to do it more. So in a way, I never felt more passionate about singing when it was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. So I, the smallest story is I could not say P. That was really difficult. Um, And because there's actually, I have a slide on this. There are nine muscles required to say P and seven out of the nine were broken and were dead in my mouth. I was going to say that wouldn't be very handy if you needed the bathroom. Exactly. I got a <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and there were lots of things. It was like, I remember even going to order something, you know, and it's like, oh, pizza, pizza, you know, and it was, like, oh. yeah. And, and actually people, it was just, people thought, you know, there was something mentally wrong with me too. Yes, that's what people would assume. Yeah. And so I would get treated differently. It was a really bizarre from the flirt to the, you know, are you okay? Good for you for going out by yourself, those kinds of things. Oh. Yeah, so it was, so I was determined to say P because I felt like those were really difficult. So I, because I'm a scientist, actually one thing my female boss, yay female scientists, um, we had journal club all the time where we would read papers outside our field. So. Uh, my upbringing, and I thought that was normal, but it's really not. So my scientific upbringing involved not being afraid of papers that had unfamiliar terms in them. So when I got Bell's palsy, I just read everything I could about the nerve damage, about... So the papers I found that were the most analogous to what I had were actually oddly phantom limb patients because 
which means soldiers or people who got a limb cut off, they still had sensation or um, observations of the limb that wasn't there. And so the way I made that equation is because my brain still thought that the nerves were wired the way they were. So they kept sending signals to something Mm -hmm. that didn't exist. So I thought if I read, so they had things like mirror therapy where you would put a mirror for the phantom limb patients where you'd only see, you know, the healthy side, both left and right, and you would try that. Then I stumbled upon, and this is something I've written about, I'm actually writing another paper that was in the Naked Vocalist blog. I stumbled upon vocal learning because where I was at Rockefeller, they studied songbirds. And so I happened to be, again, serendipity, you talk about spiritual, the place where I, I had heard lectures on songbirds from the foremost authority of songbird brains. And it turned out during that time, since I had left, another Dr. Eric Jarvis, a, a postdoc who's now there as a full-time scientist, a very famous scientist, discovered that humans um, are more like songbirds in how we sing in their brain, in our brains, it's called convergent evolution, than, than a chimpanzee. Wow. And so I read, yeah, so I read about that, you know, it's really annoying, detailed science, but that's how I retrained how to say P, is I pretended I was a songbird, and I'd never said P before, and what songbirds do and human babies do is we audiate, we hear it in our heads, and we just keep trying over and over again. Yes. And so... So mimicking. It's like mimicking, but then you also hear it in your head as well. So when you hear it in your head, so I just kept trying to send that signal to say P. And finally, you can see, I actually still don't have muscles here. I'm missing, you know, three huge muscles for P. I can still remember how I used to say it, which is P, P, because you see how this. Yes. Yes. So P, it's a little asymmetrical, but it's a different neural signal. It's a different recruitment of muscles to say P. And I remember that day when I was just sitting in the mirror going P, P. And then it finally was like P. I said, that sounds like a real P, you know? It does. It does sound like P. It doesn't sound like anything but a P. Yeah. And so that small success was sort of with that one thing sort of fed into everything in terms of that process of, of hearing what I want to sing because my larynx was a little asymmetrical because there's one muscle that done the digastric, which is raises the larynx and it tilts it. So mine was asymmetrical, which is why I lost some of my high notes, uh, Mm -hmm. which I haven't gotten back. I haven't gotten them back, but you know, I don't need that extreme anymore. But anyway, so it, it just, it, it started the process for retraining, not just speech, but singing. And it was that combination of the phantom limb and this, the vocal learning that, that helped me figure That's that it. out. Yeah. And a lot of P words like patience, perseverance, yes. and practice. Oh, How's exactly. that? I love that. I should All write the, that down. Yes. The and the first thing you would have done was go to the pizza parlor <laughs> For a P. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, actually, the irony was the first performance I had post palsy that wasn't a big role. It was just like a benefit. Was a friend of mine who was a baritone. He was a well-known baritone. He actually won a Tony for Baz Luhrmann's La Boheme. So he, Eugene Brancoviano, mm-hmm. he invited me. He said, "You need to sing again. Let's perform at this house concert, the Papageno Papagena duet." <gasps> and if you know that, that's all. Pup, pup, pup. I can't, I, I, it was really hard. <laughs> it was a little bit of a mess, but I said, out of all the duets you want to do, you want to do the Papagena one, you know? So, but, so I did have to go out in public and sing something with a lot of peas in it. Well, wow. so that was another fate thing. Like someone up there is like testing me. <laughs> Absolutely. But that would have made you even more determined. Yes, exactly. And I read that it was a, full two years after the onset of Bell's palsy that Mm -hmm. you went and performed Narina's aria from Don Pasquale. Was that the PP one? No, that was not. That was my first role. That was the first time I convinced 
Yeah, I, because people wouldn't hire, you know, I had actually a contract at SFO. I had contracts at big opera houses. But, you know, with this face, because when you're in an audition room, it's much more obvious. So it was sort of, especially for the roles I was doing. So there was a small company in San Francisco called Pocket Opera. And I just, I had sung with them before and I just said, give me a chance. You know, just, I, I promise I can be the character and, you know, we can act in other ways. And, and he did, Donald Pippen, who passed away recently, but gave me that chance to perform that role. It's up on YouTube, the, the Ari, and you can see I my- I saw film. it. Yeah. I watched it. It was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. So it's like, I could play coquettish, you know, even though, I, my face wasn't perfect. So, you know, it was, I think that was both taught me and I think taught the audience. Um, I think I had, there was a reviewer who I spoke to afterwards and he said, you know, you notice it for a second and then you forget. Absolutely. And I, think, and I do think that's, you know, I don't want people to try to pretend it's not there, you mm. know? Um, but I love the fact that he said, you notice it in the beginning and then you forget because that's really what, I'm hoping for. Yes, that end. that means that you had the audience engaged in your performance. Right, right. Yes. And yeah. also too, I believe that you had to relearn where everything was. You had to remap. Yes, I love that you brought that. So that's really, you know, neuroscience. And, and I think this is useful. We were talking about self care and, and Basically, it summarizes the entire nature of our brains. Our brains operate, they're predictors, right? Our brain is desperately, constantly trying to predict things. And so it's trying to predict where things are. So it maps things in our bodies of, you know, I can reach for this cup. Okay, that it can predict how far I have to reach out so I can grab my cup. And that's a very useful thing. If it mismaps that, if my, you know, then it gets, there's this kind of, your brain starts to panic, right? Because it's not where you thought it was. Um, so that's the physical prediction. Psychologically, there are things like that too. Anxiety, performance anxiety, which we talked about, is also rooted in prediction because your brain is trying to predict why you get anxious is your brain's making these calculations and saying, what if I mess up? What if I mess up? What if they hate me? And if those are the things your brain is actively predicting for yourself, you're going to be anxious. Mm. So that's why I like things like affirmations or these things that may seem, you know, I remember when I first heard about them, you know, the scientist in me is like, what's an, you know, why is an affirmation a good thing? You know, that doesn't make scientific sense. Well, it actually makes really important scientific because you're training your brain to predict something positive, to predict that this is going to work out or that this is going to be okay because it's that disconnect that causes problems yeah. yes and this is a question that i was really keen to ask you is there a difference between the mind and the brain yeah so i would there's two answers i can give you i would say scientists struggle with this question mm -hmm. I definitely have read the camp that says no, and I definitely understand the camp that says yes. How I feel about it is I think the the brain is an organ that has a function. The mind is defined by your brain and your body in the outside world. And those, because your mind is constructing all of that what I said, the prediction, the interactions, the spiritual. Um, of course, there are chemicals in your brain and, and pathways in your brain that mm. do that. So I think that's where some people, because it is all your brain making those calculations. But I think, I think it's the, I think the mind is much more about relationships between yourself and your body, yourself and yourself and yourself in the world and yourself and other people. Um, and that has this otherness to it if that makes sense. Yes, and as a scientist, mm -hmm. so let's put the science hat okay. on for a yeah. second. When people say to you that your intuition is smarter than your brain, <laughs> what? <laughs> ah. 
What does that, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes what gets us in trouble is when we, intuition I feel is a much more spontaneous, organic reaction to something that feels right. And sometimes our brains are not skilled at processing such that we can tie ourselves in knots or create something that's not there or even intuit. Um, it's it's like overthinking or ruminating, I think. So sometimes you have to yes, go with yes. your go with your gut, as they say, or 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 because sometimes that is where truth lies in that you know initial thing. And I think where we get into trouble is when we second guess and when our brains allowed to create different networks and and because there are networks and so if it's it's like taking a a fork in the road that takes you in a maze you know versus the fork versus the path that's direct and i think intuition's really direct and i think the alternative is sort of a maze so sometimes yes. it's useful to just take that direct route that's quick yes yeah. so yeah. when we talk about neuroscience we're specifically talking about the brain and science? Yeah, so I, I actually even hate the term neuroscience because it leaves out some of my favorite, because neuro means, is referring to neurons, which are cells, but the brain is so much more than neurons. You know, there's glia in there, which are more popular. So, um, but of course the field got its name just like other names, you know. So it is how the brain, how the brain, oversees everything that you are you know and everything that you do and I think as from this there's two perspectives in my life one is this you know the psychological and the self and the the being and the identity and then there's the singer and I think it informed me understanding the brain better understood both of those things much better and I realize that that's what we're lacking in the field that's what we're lacking as singers is the understanding of of how our brain does this amazing thing, right? How does it do it? We focus on, okay, my larynx is here, my breath is here, my tongue is here. But what what's telling those things to coordinate yeah. over a hundred, there are over a hundred muscles to sing. And then you have emotion and then you have, you know, there's so many, and then you have text and communication and music. There's so, it's the most complicated behavior that's, that humans do. Yes. So I think if we do not learn about how the brain creates this incredible, complicated thing, we we're missing out on a huge part of what singing is. You know, so how does that inform your teaching, say, on a daily basis? Yeah, um, I think it's funny because every time someone who studies with me who hasn't studied, I, I definitely feel like I'm a rebel a little bit. I uh, like that. Yeah. And I think I teach, I, I break it into two parts. First of all, I'm a very positive teacher. I think that's number one. We know that learning, so when I like the neuroscience of learning, so it takes sort of a, we need to be allowed to make mistakes to learn, first of all. So you have to make a mistake to sort of learn. You also have to be in a positive environment to sort of is to learn because there's dopamine involved in creating yes. these paths. So, so that's another thing. And then I am big on attention. So in the early beginning of the lesson, we tend you, like, you can only think of one thing at a time. So we'll attend to something really reductionist and simple, sort of like my P exercise, right? So if you take that little P exercise and put that into a different context as a singer, it may seem tedious at first, but it's actually fun if you make it playful because there, I'll say there's no right and wrong. Just like, you know, feel where your voice is at this end of the spectrum or this end, and then we'll find the Goldilocks and see if you like that. So it's giving a student agency to sense different things. And then the latter part of the lesson is always play, is always um, rooted in, you know, because my theory is when, I like evolution too. So we're wired to sing. Why are we wired to sing? To communicate, right? To communicate mm -hmm. emotion. So in classical singing though, and I'm sure other genres, sometimes if you're singing a sad song, 
that's really emotional with and you need that authenticity. I mean, we, I, I'm giving a talk on what is authenticity. People forget that you will always, your subconscious will always infuse a song. You know the text, you know the emotion, you know the context. That will never leave you. But sometimes I need a singer to experience an energy level that the literal does not give. Because if I'm literally sad when I'm singing a sad song, that will be reflected vocally because we're wired that way. Yes. I will have them sing it like, you know, a Baptist preacher or like a tiger in the forest or something totally off the wall. Because what you discover is that your brain sends these awesome signals for a cool vocalization and that your brain will remember that muscle feeling. So that then when you go to the authentic performance, your brain says, you know what, when I sang it like the tiger, that was really cool. But you're not thinking that consciously. It's a motor association, right? So it's like granularity in in emotion, right? Granularity in singing. The more inputs your brain has to a motor skill, the more powerful it will be. So when singers experience this song in a weird way that gives them a sound that they've never had for that song and they like it, their brain will remember it. And it doesn't matter that it came from something crazy. I love that. Yes. No, I love all that because what I feel that you're doing is humanizing the singer. And that is one, one thing that I worry about. And this is just my own personal thoughts and views on voice science is sometimes that it can get in the way. I feel it could, can possibly get in the way of forgetting that the singer is more than just a larynx. Absolutely. And I always say that like, I'm obsessed with, I mean, I teach anatomy and physiology. I think it's so important to know that, but that's not what you do when you teach it or when you're singing. And so I think it's that understanding that those two universes are important and, you know, as I said, I love teaching my singers about acoustics and all of these things because I think it's important, but I think that's not, that's very different than what you do to get at a sound. You can't think, you actually literally cannot think about that. It, it it's, mm-hmm. it's counterproductive because even things like, and I'm probably, this is going to be blasphemous, <laughs> but for example, I do not teach breathing mechanics ever okay okay and i think that shocks people and yet this but the reason is is because i after studying the brain is like as long as i am relaxed and you know in a good place if i intend what i'm if my instrument's efficient and i intend to phrase the breath actually gets recruited properly and there they've been scientific studies on like when they measure these things everyone's different anyway so if we're trying to you know so there's that's one oh, thing. True. different second there was a study one of my favorite studies i, th- I think it goes like this they asked a sing uh, a person to say like pass the salt and calculated kind of what breath when a person knew they just had to say pass the salt versus like a monologue of four score and seven years ago or whatnot the breath is is calculated based on your intention so if you have enough intention of what you want to sing and the length of the phrase or or i'll have people do a gesture for it and that can solve breath rather because we're not wired to think about the mechanism i call it cart before the horse teaching Mm, mm -hmm. if you go to every culture around the world that sings they are not teaching they're not worried about where their stomach is right they're they're singing and i think we got a lot of people true we're, yeah, we're really hung up on some of these what I call downstream things. And I was one of them. I mean, I did all sorts of breathing. I even taught that way. And I decided with a couple students, I was like, you know what? I'm going to see what happens if I don't teach breath. Just it was an experiment. And I told them I was doing that and it worked. And so now it's it was just one of those random things because I knew that that made me anxious when I was always worried about, do I have enough air? Do I have enough air? Do I have enough air? Mm. And then I just realized that the brain doesn't work that way. The brain will actually not have enough air if it panics about not having enough air. You know, that's the ironic thing. The more you worry about it, 
the faster your heart rate, you're going to take a, a higher breath, you know, when you in and also when you inhale, your heart rate goes up, right? When you exhale, your heart rate goes down, which is why if you want to feel relaxed, you extend and exhale. But if we're always worried about the inhale, our heart rate's going to go up and it's yeah, anyway. That's but, right. That is right. Yeah. 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 I don't want to mind telling a scientist she's right. <laughs> this is, but I do want to point out that because I have to be careful because many teachers teach breath and it works beautifully. Yeah. And I think the thing is, the take home message is there are many, 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 many ways to get at our art. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get too focused on what is right and what is wrong. But if it works, it's about communication between the student and the teacher because you are trying to coordinate a hundred muscles and a brain and creativity. So we really can't say there's one way. This is how I do it and it's worked. It doesn't mean that if someone else is teaching breath that it won't work because I do know plenty of teachers who teach that way. So yeah. I, I want to give that caveat. I just found it interesting that 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 was something I discovered. Yes. And I feel going back to a statement that I made earlier is yeah. that we are messed up as singers and yeah. having so much to think about already and we're already in our heads, the less yeah. we can eliminate from that self-criticism point of view, I think the better. Exactly. And to be perfectly honest, I teach a lot from like a more of a primal approach and that yeah. is from the need to sing yes exactly give give it intention and everything i find that is a lot quicker way to to fix something is to give it an intention why am i singing this and how would if i was to say it how would yes. i say it so why am i singing it if i'm asking a question a question yeah. is going to sound like a question. Then when I sing a question, why do I sound like I don't even care what it is that I'm trying to find out about? You know, so. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I agree a thousand percent. And that is how, I, that's why I love like the why we sing. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. something we don't, we, we work on the how, but we need to also bring in the why. You know, and I think once you do that, it's sort of, it gets really fun, you know, Absolutely. and that's, what, that's right. ultimately what I think everyone wants out of this, you know, and there's, I think we've also gotten towards a dangerous, you know, whether it's Photoshopping or anything else, the perfection idea, because there is something mm. beautiful about imperfection. I've had this class oh. where, we'll, where people will, will get emotional when they're singing and it's like, their voice will crack a little bit and it's like we're all bawling in the room and I, and then i say and the the person who sang is like i'm sorry i lost it and it's like no this is why we're singing yeah this is why you look at everyone in the room everyone is teary you know teary-eyed absolutely so it's, it's not about perfect it's about expression and and i think if we can give that to our students that when you're authentic and expressing and with intention that that's enough yes. because your voice will be where it is for where what because I, I love teaching adult amateurs because I feel they're they're in a way the most judgy sometimes and so I love liberating them because yes. they learn that they are where they are and what where they are is enough and they can move people with what they have rather than always chasing the gold standard yes I had a, a very big CCM performance career. Yeah. That, that spanned yeah. 35 years. Yeah. And I, but you are 35, so you started. Oh, sorry, I'm 21. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mucked up the figures there somehow. <laughs> Clearly not a mathematician. We're both 21. Yeah, nor a scientist. <laughs> okay. Um, but what I was going to say was that through that experience, I learned that a, an audience will forgive imperfections if you're delivering your authentic self and they right. feel connected to your performance. You can right. get up and sing something so something so perfectly. Right. And it is, I'm going to use my swear jar. Okay. That shit boring. Exactly. 
Okay. Yeah, We're equal now. It. We both. <laughs> now we have one in there. Yeah. yeah. We each yeah. have one. We each yeah, we have did. one. Yeah. But just saying, you know, I learned that and I love that other teachers are now allowing themselves to say that we're all daring to say that and those imperfections i believe are our unique voice absolutely no we don't want clones you know and no. i think and i think in the classical world it's 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 really i i don't know about i mean ccm you'll have to tell me i do feel like there's this desire to have a perfect sound. I don't know whether it's because of recordings that have, yeah. but in the classical it's world, it's not everyone, authentic. Yeah, and everyone starts sounding the same mm -hmm. and they're totally disconnected from what, the, that's why I, I even encourage movement. I mean, how many students come yes. in and they're just like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what? You know, it's like, how did you do that? that? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing moved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think it's that idea of, you know, have them move and, and because our bodies and musicality are connected. And if we're telling people, I always say, you're not going to go on stage just because you're moving now and dancing while you're singing. They fear like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get into that habit and do it on stage. I said, no, you're not. Mm. You know, that's a, that's a prediction that your brain made. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is if you try to stay still and then your hand has sort of like a a twitch because it wants to move and you're trying to inhibit those are where the awkward gestures come from it's from inhibition it's not from allowing and then when they go on stage the gestures are natural and they're mm. authentic because their body has been permitted to to go with whatever the music is doing that's you know? it uh, in ccm i just when i teach my students i just tell them to feel the rhythm in their bodies just yeah. feel it in your body. And yes. it's, it's really interesting with CCM, there is a particular sound that's out right now, right. but that sound is 100% totally manufactured in studios. They're now stripping away all the natural acoustics in the voice and layering them with all these vocal effects. And I'm most disappointed in Ed Sheeran. So Ed Sheeran, mm -hmm. If you're listening to this podcast, yes. Ed, I'm on. very disappointed in you right now because you now sound, sound like Justin Bieber, Shawn Mendes, and every other singer that's out there. You don't even sound like Ed Sheeran anymore, and I'm very disappointed. Oh, my. I, I love that you said that. My daughter's a really talented. She's 14, talented. CC, I mean, I don't know CC, how to teach CCM, although I do feel like we can all teach voice, but it's that idea. I, yes. But she's a great singer and songwriter, and we were listening to Ed Sheeran, I think, in the car, and she was saying they're all starting to sound alike. She they pointed. Are. No, they are. They are. And, it's a specific and, sound. Yeah, and then we started talking about the, how that became a thing aesthetically, mm -hmm. and I introduced her to Castrati. So we were listening to Castrati, which are the operatic singers who got their. Yes. Yeah, yep. their balls cut off. I can say that. Is that a square jar thing? Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And so we were making that comparison because she said that's what those art the artificial guys sound like. They, she said they sound like they got their freaking balls cut off. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they need to. Then they have a legitimate reason. No, yeah. no, no. It's all it's all manufactured right now. And yeah. the hard part about that, and I'll finish, I'll wrap this up, right. but the, yeah. the difficult part about that is that when CC, new CCM singers come to your studio, they want to sound like those recordings, but they don't have a hope in hell because it's all created in the studio. It's not a natural sound. So they're mm -hmm. turning themselves inside out to make a sound they will never, ever be able to make. Right. No, and, and the same with classical because, even, you know, it's this perfectly even resonant tone because they can fix any imperfection in the studio. So I think that's something that we have to impart is embrace imperfection and, and authenticity. Yes. Now, yeah. I'm going to change the, the, the questioning just a little here. I have okay. so many other questions I want to ask you that I feel you need to come back because I really would love to know more about neuroscience. There's yeah. so many questions around that. But what I do want to ask you a few things. 
Firstly, I know that you love all the old pedagogical, the, the historical pedago pedagogical texts. Yes. When you read those books, <laughs> do you think to, you, to yourself, what were they thinking? And I asked Dan Mitten the same question. What um, were they thinking? Or you as a scientist, do you respect their natural curiosities? Yeah, I love that question. I think what, as I said, what I love about science, and I, I put these voice scientists in the same same category, is that science evolves, right? So they knew, they made conclusions with what they had at the time. And there's something fun about, it's like the earth being flat, right? It's like, when they found out it was round, it was like, holy shit, the earth is round, what? And I feel like I, oh yeah, see, exactly. So I feel like, I feel like in voice, I look back and I say, I can't believe they thought that, but I know I, I don't blame them for that because it's, it's part of the history. But I do think what's different about singing that's mm. in, in basic science is that there are a lot of voice teachers that hang on to what I call our, uh, these old texts that are just snapshots in time. Yes. And they forget that it's evolved since then. So they will say, well, Richard Miller said this in, you know, 1982. And it's, you know what, it's different now. And I even have Richard Miller, I'll say the one thing that he did change his mind on that's still in his text. And it had to do with me. We, we corresponded. He used to say that you needed to lift here to get higher resonances. So he has that in his book. And people have published that since. You need to lift your zygomaticus to get an operatic thing. And I, when I got this, I said, Richard, I can't do that, but I have my higher resonances. And he said, you know what? That was never really proven. And then I did control it. So, but it's in all of his texts and people still oh. believe it. So anyone out there who still believes that we, it's been disproven, you know, but, and now the reason is more emotional is now we know when you're happy. And I did this with brass players. I had brass players do an experiment where they thought a happy thought and they also got higher resonances, but they're not smiling. Yes. It's association with joy and brightness that makes higher resonances, not the physical necessarily. Right. So, Anyway, so that was one of those things, but all those texts have little things like that that are overturned, but people are still like, but mm -hmm. Miller said it, Bernard said it, you know, it's like, well. Yes, like, yes. Yeah. I could say something really politi politically incorrect right there, but I, I was going to say it's probably all the Trump supporters. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, it goes back to, it goes back to brain, the brain likes to predict and it will believe untrue crap and that's the mm -hmm. problem and people nowadays will believe what they want to believe and it's scary because that's why i think if people knew about neuroscience and knew that we can we construct our realities that we'd be a much better society if people like i, I have this niece that's like learning the planets right and it's like don't teach her the planets teach her fucking neuroscience because that's what she needs because we'd be better people if we knew, you know what, I'm constructing this reality right now and I will believe with certainty when we don't know with certainty. Yes. What I'm saying right now, 50 years from now, they will look back and laugh. Like, how did she believe that? You know, I was part of the discovery that DNA is looped, by the way. So that was my big paper. Up until then, my, even my textbooks in, graduate, in, in school, DNA was linear. Wow. So we we overturned a belief just like the earth is flat so that i'm actually wow. sort of more well known for that so the end of dna is looped so now all the textbooks the dna is looped so that generation did not know that i was taught that dna is linear so even at that level there's things that are overturning and changing and um that's going to happen 50 years from now so we can't be so hanging on to these truths we have to be curious we were talking about curiosity earlier yes curiosity is so important and being able mm -hmm. to say i was wrong and and embrace embrace like oh yeah that's so cool i was wrong but people don't do that right anymore <laughs> no they don't people don't embrace their mistakes they don't yeah. embrace things being wrong but that's how you learn absolutely i it's think that, yes <laughs> what are the projects you're working on right now 
So right now I'm sort of going through, I, I cut back at the conservatory. I'm only teaching one class because I'm trying, I love, you know, I wish you could get paid for just like reading papers and writing and thinking, but you can't, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm hearing you, girlfriend. <laughs> like oh so i did launch a website it's in its infancy but i'm i'm starting to teach more um i love telling stories about uh, t distilling complex neuroscience for the general population and singers in a way that makes sense so i'm i'm starting to teach more singing in the brain i call it like singing, yes. in, the brain, singing yes. in the brain and biohacks and and things like that, um, and journal clubs, bringing mainstream neuroscience research to the voice community in an accessible way. I call it minding the gap, where, oh. where you know, us, because, uh, um, and that's where I got that 10 second, you know, memory thing, because that's a paper voice teachers would not find. It's a, the wording of it is really complicated, but if you extract that information, all voice teachers should be doing that kind of thing in the studio, you know, because yes. that will help their students learn. So I'm trying to bridge these worlds, be like the translator in a way. Yes, um, I this love it. Yeah, th and, and I keep up to date, you know, because it, neuroscience is one of the most rapidly evolving areas. So new stuff comes out all the time. Mm. Uh, so I translate that and apply it. There's there's just, you know, whether it's the vocal learning, I have this whole great thing, um, Eddie Chang at UCSF, who does articulator motor signaling. We have two laryngeal motor cortices. There's just all these great things that can be translated to practical things for a voice teacher. So that's sort of where I'm at, is, is trying to create either courses or, you know, consulting or give lectures on that intersection so that, that that paradigm can be overturned in some of these areas. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we will share your links in the show notes. So we will share uh, all, where people can find you, where they can join the journal club. I want to join yeah. your journal club. Yeah, come join I'm, the journal club. I love, I, honestly, I love the work of Dr. Daniel Amen. I think yes. that's And Carolyn Leaf and a lot of those yes. people that are that are doing some fantastic work in the field and making it accessible to the general public so i'm yeah absolutely geeking out on that and that's why i'd love to have you back and maybe we can talk yeah. further about this and that would be great so based on your knowledge and your expertise what's one thing that teachers should learn about when it comes to neuroscience what's one thing just one thing just one just thing. one okay I would say smaller chunks. I think when singers have to do, you know, everyone wants to come into a lesson and sing the song from start to finish with all the words and all, you know, they want to do everything because that's the end result. So I like this idea of chunking in a, in a fun way. It's like taking a smaller segment and playing with, permutations of it, whether it's inverting some of the notes uh, so that they can, or transposing it so they don't feel registration. So it's sort of like play within a smaller chunk. And that is related to vocal learning. So I have students who take a songbird lesson. We call it a songbird lesson where they're not allowed to look at the music because I think sheet music, we need to read music, but it's bad for the singer brain, unfortunately. Oh, absolutely. They think a high note is up and it's not. It's a, your brain has no, people even forget that like half steps are wider as you go up because it's a log scale. So that's why half steps are really hard as you go higher, you know? So I think that idea of being more like songbirds sometimes and, and really embracing our songbird brain. I don't know oh, if that's- I yeah. love that. I want to be a songbird. I think I was yeah. more like a crow though. <laughs> But that's fine, you know. Make all the noises. That's the other thing. Make make all sorts of noises, you know. Yes. Okay. I'm only one more. One more question. I promise I let you go. Oh, no. Based on your personal experience, what is the best advice you could give to anybody in terms of physical well being? Ooh, that is I have to say sleep. 
um, I think we take that for granted, but that is where your learning occurs. That is where your motor imprinting and your well-being and everything else will follow. You know, the exercise, the eating, the positivity, all of that. But if you're not getting good sleep, nothing will work. Nothing yes. will work. Yes. Sort of a fundamental, you know, um, there was a great some uh, sleep scientist. I know you're going to have. So everyone listen to when the sleep scientist comes on your show that they said, how do we know that we weren't designed to sleep and that being awake is sort of 